Eh, muy buenas tardes, eh, good evening, bienvenidos, eh, welcome to the Instituto Cervantes eh, Manchester and Leeds YouTube channel. First of all, I would like to extend a warm welcome to our guest, Álvaro Santana Acuña and Professor Rossi Song. Thank you for joining us uh, for our continuing series of libraries, publications in Hispanic studies in collaboration with Professor Rossi Song, who is professor and deputy head of the School of Modern Languages and Culture at the uh, Doran University. In this series, uh, we, uh, we we try to show the uh, um, the works and uh, discussions about the contemporary Hispanic culture in British and American academia. Our host, Professor Rossi Song, has published many works on contemporary Spanish culture, film and literature, and some of her publications include uh, Lost in Transition, Constructing Memory in Contemporary Spain, A Taste of Barcelona, The History of Catalan Cooking and Eating in as co-author, and also Trace of Contamination and Earthy, the Francoist Legacy in Contemporary Spanish Discourse and of Towards Cultural Archive, Arch Archive of La Movida as co-editor. Her articles have appeared in the Journal of Hispanic Cultural oh, Studies, uh, MLN, uh, Revista de Estudios Hispánicos, and uh, Romance Notes, It's America, Revista Iberoamericana, and Hispania, among others. This series explores the vast research of Hispanic uh, studies that take place in British and American universities presenting books of scholars who discuss various topics in Spanish and Latin American cultures like film, literary, literary, musical and artistic studies. Today our discussion will center on the launch of the book of Alvaro Santana Acuña's book Accent to Glory, How 100 Years of Solitude was written and became a global classic published by Columbia University in 2020. Santania uh, Acuña details uh, the uh, unlikely success on 100 years of solitude, delving into the Gabriel Garcia Marquez writing process, as well as the literary ideas and networks that made the book into a global classic today, which has been published in more than 70 countries in five continents. But Accent to Glory, sold uh, in 31 countries, has already made uh, and enjoyed its own success. Santia, Santana Acuña, an associate professor of sociology at Whitman College, has received positive reviews from reputable sources in over 12 countries and five languages. Some notable uh, reviews are, for example, a readable and enjoyable scholarly book from Revista Harvard Review of Latin America, an essential work for admirers of 100 Years of Solitude from Telegraph India, or a book, Sin un Dato Fuera de Lugar, from El País. So thank you very much for uh, joining us, for being with us tonight, for the launch of this exciting book. And um, finally, if you have any questions, you can write them down in the chat box. After the discussion, we will have uh, 15 minutes with questions and answers with the authors. And with a first I do, uh, I give the floor to Professor Rosison. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pedro Jesus, for the generous introduction. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today, uh, tonight, at our uh, last Ex Libris uh, series for uh, this term. And thank you so much, Álvaro Santana Acuña, our guest for tonight's conversation, uh, and the author of this magnificent book, Uh, called Ascent to Glory, How 100 Years of Solitude was written and became a global classic. As you can see, I have made many, many, many notes on this amazing book, and I think that it's on its way to become its own classic. Welcome, Alvaro. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Rosy. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here with you, and I just want to also thank Pedro and the Instituto Cervantes for the invitation to be here and also Durham University for um, uh, co-organizing this event. So I'm really looking forward to a wonderful conversation with you. Um, so thank you. 
Thank you. So there are so many things to talk about this book. And basically, I think that what this book does is sort of tell the outside story of already a magnificent story. And before I ask you in very general terms about how you present this book, I was thinking about the way you think about this book as, as somebody that enters or at least expresses a knowledge about a book without having read it. And where does that knowledge come from? So can you very briefly explain this book and how it started and how where it took you? Yeah, so that's a wonderful question to get started. So uh, Ascent to Glory, it's uh, simply put a, a biography of uh, the novel, right? So the making of, and also how it became uh, a global classic. Uh, so in a way it is two, uh, is two books in one book because I tell, uh, you know, two stories that usually um, colleagues in sociology and in history and also in literary studies uh, approach um, differently, right? So the question about how the novel was written and then the question of how the novel became so successful uh, globally. So, and, and of course, you know, it, this is a project that took a long time. I started that project when I was a, a graduate student at the uh, at Harvard University. And one of the things I, I mentioned in the acknowledgements is that I started thinking about this book by accident. So I was, um, you know, so those of you who know, Cambridge, uh, the new Cambridge, not the old Cambridge in the UK. <laughs> so Cambridge, Massachusetts. So we know that it's a, it's a, in a, it's an area that where it rains a lot. And the, the fall of uh, 2007, uh, it was raining uh, almost every day. And it was my first time living in, in, in Cambridge. And then one day after several, several, several days of uh, almost um, never ending rain, I was walking to one of the, the libraries on campus. And then all of a sudden I was just struck by this thought that I said out loud, whoa, it rains like in my condo here. And then I started thinking, well, why, I, why did I actually make that connection between that fictional place and something that was happening to me right there? Uh, because also I have never been to Latin America at that time, that was over 15 years ago. And also it was more, almost over 20 years uh, when I read uh, 100, of, 100 of Solitude for the first time. So then, uh, you know, without knowing, I was already planting the seed for what became uh, the book, uh, which in which I was trying to, from a very uh, individual perspective, I was actually trying to answer that very question that I asked myself: Why did I make? Why did I make the connection between uh, the novel and my personal experience? And then that became like the thesis, the the core idea of the book, which is really that classics are classics because they have this power to enter our lives in ways that are completely out of our control. So, um, however, uh, while I was just answering that part of the problem, more the question about how something becomes classic, then I had the, the opportunity also to um, visit the archives of uh, Garcia Marquez at the Harry Ramson Center at the University of Texas at Austin. And then uh, I stumbled upon a lot of new documents and sources and that would allow me to tell the story of how he wrote the book with a fresh and, 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 a, new, and a new perspective. Thank you. That is actually a really good introduction to this book because I think in the journey what you discover is actually the amazing world that opens around this novel. And I think that you really identified um, certain structures or networks, right? That not only uh, enable this book to be written in a way, and I like to spend some time talking about um, these different ways in which this book uh, comes to life, um, that in a way, um, complicates uh, one of the way this book is it, um, creates its own myth of this sort of single genius creation that clearly Garcia Marquez is a very talented writer. He wrote a magnificent work, but what sort of sustain the creation of such a work and in what way it benefited from its own time right, that um, speaks in the way later on how this 
kind of work enters our lives. And actually, I will have to say that is raining like in Macondo in Newcastle, UK. Uh, we are in the middle of a storm again, so mm. we hope we're not losing electricity like we okay. did a couple of weeks ago. Oh. Uh, so I think we're in a very good setting for this conversation. <laughs> so let's start with that idea of Garcia Marquez writing this novel on his own. Can you talk a little bit more about that myth? And introduce us a little bit more about the generation of writers that he belongs to. Mm -hmm. And I would really like to hear you talk a little bit, and especially for our uh, listeners, the idea of the literatura latinoamericana, the Latin American literature. Yeah, so th these are certainly um, great questions. So let me address the different points. Uh, which you know cover like <laughs> several chapters in the book. Uh, well, first of all, I certainly um, agree with you that there is something that relates to one of solitude that we that is important to put on the table as soon as possible, which is you know the the question of the myth, right? And one of the things that I discover in the process of doing the research is that every um, every major work of literature, especially a classic in one way or another is surrounded by myths, right? So then instead of trying to deconstruct or uh, deny the myths that were, um, that surround the making of Juan of Solitude, I realized that myth making is a very important factor in the transformation of a, a work of art into a classic. I'm not only thinking about literary works, but I'm thinking about, for instance, you know, Mona Lisa or the Beethoven Ninth Symphony or the Beatles songs right now that the Beatles uh, are back. <laughs> so, so then one of the things that I try to do in the book is not really to um, tell people, oh, this is a myth and don't trust that is not really useful. On the contrary, I try to show that it's important, it's important to also pay attention to the myths mm -hmm. as we're trying to explain how something becomes a classic. However, of course, if I want to explain how the novel was written, I need to go beyond the myths and I need to really um, understand how he actually wrote it. And here I was facing several myths. And one of them is, a, is a, the, the myth of a, the, the genius, uh, the, um, the, the highly creative writer uh, working in solitude in his studio and then writing a masterpiece while he's having very little contact, if no contact whatsoever with the outside world, right? And it's interesting because this is also a myth that we also find in uh, other cases. So, for instance, you know, when I lived in Edinburgh, a little bit further uh, north where you are, so I remember that there was also a myth about J.K. Rowling, you know, writing her book, uh, the first, uh, the first novel of the Harry Potter series in solitude in these very harsh socio-economic conditions, and this is also the way I open uh, *As Into Glory* by retelling the story of the myth. Um, about how Garcia Marquez stumbled upon the first sentence of the novel and then he returned back home because he discovered the beginning of the novel uh, in his way to Acapulco for a family vacation and then a, uh, a cow crossed the road and then he had to stop suddenly and then at that very moment as if the, the, the sentence, the beginning of the novel descended upon him, he realized that the novel was already there and then he returned and then he, um, he locked himself up in his studio for 18 months uh, nonstop while debts accumulated and then he left the studio and he has written this masterwork, right? Well, that it's a myth and certainly myths have parts of truth and not uh, truth. And one of the things that I discovered is that uh, and this is also one of the things that even uh, uh, um, researchers interested in literature, art, and also Garcia Marquez have appreciated in the reviews, which is that showing with very clear um, evidence the collective effervescence, the collective work that went into uh, the making of the novel. In other words, Garcia Marquez wrote the novel, of course, uh, in, in, in solitude in his studio, but he was also surrounded by an extremely uh, competent and supportive uh, group of people. And I'm just gonna take this as an opportunity to show you one of the, the, uh, the, image, the, the graphs in uh, the books I have. Uh, 
a lot of uh, images I want to show you, but this is the first one, right? So, so I, I talk about networked creativity. Right? So this very idea that the novel was created uh, using a network. So as you can see here, Garcia Marquez in 1965, when he started writing the novel, he was living in Mexico City, but he was not alone. And, and these are people who had an impact on the writing of the novel, whether because they talked to him on a daily basis such as his wife, and also uh, the two people he dedicated, dedicated the novel to, Maria Luisa Elio and Homie Garcia Scott. Also, another couple that came to see him almost every day and chat about you know, life and family, and certainly the novel he was writing, were also the, the, the writer, Alvaro Mutis, and uh, his wife, Carmen Miracle. And then on, on the, on the constellation of uh, people, he was actually seen on a regular basis and he was showing them the manuscript as he did with Eman, the literary critic Emmanuel Carvalho, who uh, Garcia Marquez was meeting with him every week and showing him the manuscript. And then they would actually talk about the manuscript as he was actually writing it, right? Uh, and then other people lost in Mexico. But then also Carlos Fuentes, the famous... Mexican writer at that time when Garcia Marquez was writing novel, he was actually living in, in Paris. And there is this back and forth of letters exchange in which Fuentes is giving uh, support, uh, animos, right, to Garcia Marquez as he was struggling to write the novel. And, and Garcia Marquez asked him questions about, for instance, what do you think about the title of the novel, Cien Años de Soledad? And Fuente said, oh, this is great. Keep going. You can make it. And then, right. So, and the same thing with Vargas Llosa or, you know, the, the literary agent Balcells. Also, Alejo Carpentier uh, in Cuba, he would come to Mexico City. He would meet with Garcia Marquez and he would, Carpentier would actually give um, Garcia Marquez tips about language, for instance, how to use language. Why? Well, because now that we see things in, in retrospect, it seems as if Garcia Marquez was you know, cho the chosen one to write this wonderful novel. But the truth is that in 1965, when he started writing the novel, Garcia Marquez has never written anything over 200 pages long. So he was really afraid of, well, am I going to be able to write a, a, a full, a full length novel? And then he surrounded himself by people who could actually kind of mentor him along the way. And also, uh, you know, people in, in Latin America. So this is one of the, so this is really the network that surrounded the author as he was writing the novel. And I think this is very um, different from the traditional view of the creator working in isolation and not receiving any feedback. And of course, to also, as uh, Rossi, you were mentioning before, he was also getting this feedback from uh, colleagues who belong to different generations, right? So Garcia Marquez belonged to a very specific generation, the generation of Donoso, uh, Fuentes, right? But there was also the generation of Cortázar and Rulfo and the generation, uh, an older generation also with uh, Asturias and Neruda. And what also happened at this time, and this is also the reason why this novel was partly successful because of that, it was also this, enthusiasm about many books that were being published mm -hmm. in uh, Latin America at the time. At, at, at the moment it was called the New Latin American Novel. And then the success so, was so great that people actually started re start referring to it as a Latin American boom, right? The so-called Latin American boom. And One Year of Solitude was a product of that boom, but then later on stopped being only just a novel of the boom and start and start be, and it became something uh, different. Right. It almost it, it the way that you tell the story, as you just said, um, 100 years of solitude actually is the product of this boom. But somehow later we think that the boom happened because of this novel. So somehow the chronology of the way we understand this classic has changed. And I was wondering if we could th think a little bit more because this, this categorization of the works or the way we organize um, these novels in the way that we were taught in, in academic programs and so on. Um, so we always think about these um, tension between national literatures and more sort of 
uh, Latin American literatures. Like, so for example, even in the academic organization of departments, for example, there's always this, this sort of tension between why is it Latin American studies in Spain, right? So it's one country against a continent. Um, and reading your book, um, I was following sort of this uh, logic, why at some point it becomes almost a marketing tool right, to start thinking about not a Peruvian novel, not a Colombian or an Argentinian novel, but to think about a Latin American novel. So do you agree with this, this way that we're thinking? Was that sort of a, 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 a product of its time? Or is this something that we should uh, reflect and sort of value as, as a category? Yeah, I think that that's a that's a very important debate uh, to have. You know, I'm I'm of the opinion that the Latin American boom, even though it exploded in the 1960s, it was really in the making for already um, uh, 20 years, right? So already in the 1940s, uh, there were uh, editors from uh, the United States. Were, who were actually like Gnoft, for instance, um, who were traveling in the region looking for new talent. And that was not, at that, at that moment, writers at Fuentes and Donoso were uh, in their, you know, barely finishing high school, see? Mm -hmm. So who were these editors looking for? Well, people like Neruda and Asturias, so that generation, right? So then the boom is really the culmination of a, of a relatively long historical, historical process, right? In which are other factors involved. And what is really important is that at that moment, around the 1930s and 1940s, already this old generation of writers, they started really to think about, okay, well, do we really want to commit only to write fiction that is national? In other mm -hmm. words, do I only want my, my works to be works of Mexican literature or Peruvian literature or you know, Colombian literature? And then several of these authors, um, such as uh, Asturias um, or uh, the Venezuelan writer Ursula Pietri or even Alejo Carpentier, Cuban, they met in Paris in the late 1920s and they really had conversations about but the things that un united them more than divided them as, right. as uh, citizens of uh, the Latin American region. So then they really start to think about, well, it is actually possible to write a literature that it speaks about the, the, the experience of all people living in that region, not just uh, you know, Argentines or Colombians, right? So then what we see already in the 1940s is that, that the, the foundations of what later on became known of Latin American literature were being put in, in place. In other words, the, the writers started to really believe that it was possible to write a literature that would be different from, first of all, the Spanish of Spain, right? So it would be a, a different kind of Spanish and also that we can write literature that really speaks to people living in the region. So then when Carlos Fuentes and Vargas Llosa or Donoso uh, um, came out of age, these authors had already been joined by Cortázar and by Rulfo, who were also identifying with that idea of, well, we really need to speak to the, our readers in the region as a whole, not just in, 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 in a country. So they truly believe in this idea that it was possible to write a, a, a literature for the region. And it's not an, it's not an innocent uh, outcome that, as I show in the book, this was in these 20 years, we actually see an increase of the, the, the label uh, Literatura Latinoamericana Americana or Latin American literature being used in uh, publications in major uh, languages, like, such as in French, in Italian, in German, and of course in English and in, in Spanish. So there was a sense in which they really were thinking about, okay, well, we need to label ourselves in a different way because we're writing a different kind of literature. Mm -hmm. And what was really important for Garcia Marquez is that he, um, he became a professional writer and he absorbed all these ideas. So, so then there was a moment when he was living in Mexico City when he realized that what he has been, what he wanted to write and what he had been uh, writing for the past you know, 10 years or so was Colombian literature, but at mm -hmm. the same time was uh, literatura latinoamericana. Mm -hmm. So, and then the commercial success came later, but they all somehow share this basic 
agreement that they really wanted to write books for uh, people in the region as a whole, not just for national audiences. Yeah, and perhaps that idea of a region rather sort of the national literature is actually sustained by the material development in publishing and such. And I was wondering if perhaps your own training as a sociologist also has trained you to look outside of that book, right? To sort of figure out why are the uh, social sort of structures that allow, for example, a literary phenomenon to happen. And I was wondering if you could um, tell uh, our audience a little bit more about, for example, the role that the publishing industry is mm -hmm. playing at this point. Uh, as you mentioned, the agents or representatives of these publishing houses actually going and trying to discover authors or hear from them. And also even the thinking about of the literary agent as an important player, right? Uh, in the way that literature, um, literary publications happen and these books become more known mm -hmm. uh, in uh, different uh, social contexts. Yeah, and, and you certainly put it very nicely, right? So, so what I just described in the previous answer was a change in ideas, right? So, so writers in the region really trying to um develop a, a, a literary program or agenda for the region of course you know as i said it was a basic agreement you know many of them had different ways about how we should do that but that was not the first time already in the middle of the 19th century there were writers who really also were trying to develop a way of okay is it possible to write a literature that can can really capture the, the experience of uh, this region right uh, but that effort failed because it didn't go beyond small lit circles in you know different different countries right i think what uh changed in the 1940s 50s and especially the 60s is that there was also a boom of the publishing industry right so one of the things that it's very clear it's that change at the material level as well. In other words, for the first time, uh, paperbacks uh, became accessible to hundreds, if not thousands of readers. And it's, it's very interesting because, you know, this is happening in the UK and the, uh, so this presentation, and many of my colleagues in the, United, in the UK have, have studied the paperback revolution in Great Britain after World War II, right? Uh, especially, you know, through, um, Places like Penguin, right? Mm -hmm. And how the paperback revolution was absolutely critical to expand the readership uh, uh, among the middle classes. Well, something like that, which has not yet been fully studied, happened also in Latin America in the mm -hmm. 1960s. So we had a paperback revolution and then cheap, affordable, and sometimes also beautifully designed mm -hmm. copies of books written by young authors and also consecrated authors like say Borges, for instance, start to circulate. And that was possible because you know, there was uh, a change in the, in the, in the way uh, these books could, could circulate. So for, and especially one of the centers of that transformation was Spain. So, uh, so the Franco regime in the late 1950s start to implement a series of changes to improve the economy of uh, the country. Mm -hmm. So one of the changes took place in the tourist industry. So bring more tourists to Spain. And, you know, there is another story that can be said about that, you know, the arrival of Scandinavians, you know, the, the Spaniards, then all of a sudden discover other Europeans. But also, interestingly, another sector that for the Spanish government was really critical was book publishing. So then the government introduced a series of uh, measures to actually uh, lower the cost of importing paper and also, for instance, it was actually uh, cheap for Spanish presses to export books to Latin America because the Spanish government would actually pay for the shipping of the books. So then all of a sudden, in the early, um, in the early 1960s, you see these millions, hundreds of books being printed and exported to Latin America. And, and that were the books of Rulfo or the books of Borges were textbooks were books consumed by the rising middle classes in Latin America. And that was, you know, the very important material change that was necessary also to make the boom materially 
possible. And of course, you know, you mentioned also intermediary as well. You know, this is also the moment when we see the rise of the modern literary agent. Mm -hmm. And of course, one of the most famous literary agents that emerges from that, that period was uh, the Car Carmen Balcells uh, agency in Barcelona, which was also crucial to role of also uh, connect readers to authors. Yes, and this sort of material uh, situation or, or, or revolution, right, that has happened that sustained it, uh, I think, as you said, it is one of the aspects that need to be uh, studied more. And actually reading your book, I was reminded of me growing up actually in Latin America, reading a lot of these edit, you know, publishers, right? A lot of the publish, uh, publishing houses or series or names or imprints that they had, those were everywhere. Uh, mm -hmm. And I didn't actually realize they were such part of a larger story. So thank you very much for actually illuminating almost mm -hmm. my literary genealogy here. Yeah. But perhaps a lot of this discussion takes us away from the book, right? And I don't want to make uh, give an impression that your book is only about sort of the outside of 100 mm -hmm. years mm -hmm. of solitude because you do spend an, a very big chunk of the book actually telling uh, the story of the book and how actually Garcia Marquez writes this book. So can you tell us a little bit about what do you think uh, in sort of the formation and the story of Garcia Marquez as a writer, as you said, right? Before he writes 100 Years of Solitude, he has not written anything over 200 pages long. Uh, his training as a journalist is very interesting interaction with censors, actually. Uh, mm -hmm. That was mm -hmm. very interesting. Um, so looking through that story of Garcia Marquez as a writer, as the author of what will become 100 Years of Solitude, what will be some of the uh, characteristics or elements or stories that you would like to uh, share with our audience tonight? Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, well, uh, maybe this is a, a common <clears throat> common thing already said, but had to be researched. You know, geniuses are not born, uh, they are made, right? So uh, and one of the things that, that I do in the book is actually to reconstruct the early years of Garcia Marquez, right? To really try to understand how the imagination that, you know, it's in the novel, all these wonderful stories, characters, where do they come from? You know, and the techniques that he, he uses to uh, write the book. Well, they didn't come from nowhere, right? So then one of the things that I do precisely using the, the archives of Garcia Marquez and, and other sources from you know like seven countries because I had to travel to several countries to find these sources is really to reconstruct okay where does you know the style come from right where is you know the character of uh, Coronel Aureliano Buendia where where does it come from right and then you can see how this very um, smart kid is becoming uh, interested in literature and how he's starting to incorporate techniques from uh, writing techniques from Virginia Woolf, who he truly admired um, from an early age. Um, also uh, William Faulkner, uh, but also local writers such as Salamea Borda, right? Or uh, Roja Gerazo, his friend uh, in um, one of the newspapers he was working, right? And of course, other Latin American writers such as Neruda. Uh, mm -hmm. So then what I do in the book is actually try to see how he's you know, taking bits and pieces from these different authors and then how they start shaping his creative skills, right? his professional skills. So then what you can see is how he's emerging as a professional. Mm -hmm. And also, of course, we have the, the tendency to think that writers learn to write through other writers only. Uh, but Garcia Marquez actually was really interested in storytelling, not, not mm -hmm. just literature. He was really interested in how to tell a, a good story. And of course you can learn how to tell a good story, not just from books, but from other sources. Mm -hmm. So from a very uh, early age, he was really interested in cinematic storytelling. So he was really interested in cinema and then he was a film critic and he wrote I think over 200 uh, film reviews. And then he studied montage, which montage in cinema, as many um, uh, montage experts uh, would tell you, is really about you know, the crafting of the, 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 the narrative of the movie, because you need to decide where the images go, right? Well, he learned that as well, because he really wanted to learn skills about how can I tell a story 
from uh, from cinema. And of course, as you mentioned, he was, and this is uh, more well known, he was also a journalist and, and his college education basically happened working for newspapers in which one of the editors would come and sit down with him and then with pen and paper, who would just try crossing things out and then, um, and then teaching him how to, uh, how to write. And then there are other two pieces of surprise here about how he was also absorbing skills about how can I make sure that my readers mm -hmm. understand and like what I, what I read. One of them is censorship, right? So uh, the, let's not forget that censorship, including in countries such as you know, the UK, uh, was a common practice. In France as well, let's not just, you know, don't forget, for instance, when the Ulysses by James Joyce came out, you know, was huge. You cannot publish it in the UK because it would be completely censored. Lolita by Nabokov, right? So, so there is actually this untold story about censorship and how it impacted creators. And Garcia Marquez had to face censorship as a journalist in Colombia in the mid fifties when he was writing, you know, daily, um, daily chronicles. So then he learned how the censor censored his writing, right? Mm -hmm. And then he started to, so then he started to learn how can I write things in a way they can pass censorship, right? And these are the skills that then we find in his writing. And then another one that it's even more surprising uh, is that he was in marketing. So Garcia Marquez had experience in marketing as a freelance uh, um, um, ad man uh, in the 1960s. And when you start scratching the surface a little bit, it's interesting that people like Alejo Carpentier uh, and also Juan Rulfo actually work in advertising. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I think there is uh, also a story that I tell through Garcia Marquez that needs to be told by other uh, boom writers, which is actually how exposure to marketing techniques help them to then uh, learn how to uh, even sell your writing to, uh, to readers because, uh, there is a very important point here also, which I make in the book, which is uh, let's not forget that, that uh, Carpentier, Rulfo, Garcia Marquez were basically selling things to the rising middle class, right? And then Garcia Marquez found himself four years later writing a book, One of Solitude, for the same audience that he was basically trying to produce um, an ad so that they would just buy you know, a fridge or a washing machine. Right. Um, this is a really bad segue because I do not want to compare what I'm about to say with a fridge, but I think that we cannot avoid a discussion about magic realism, right? Mm -hmm. So, realismo magico. So, can you walk us through those two words, that label, mm -hmm. that uh, so useful, so overused? Uh, so exploited, we can have very different uh, relationships with uh, this label, I think. But can you give us a little bit more history about it? Yeah. And also to our audience, I'm going to start asking questions uh, with one last question after this one. So if you already know what you're going to ask, this is a good moment to start typing your questions in the chat. And I also will invite you to join you by unmuting yourselves. Thank you. So Alvaro, yes, let's talk yeah. about those words. Yeah, thank you, Rossi. So uh, magical realism, I actually opened the first chapter precisely with the, the, the fact that Garcia Marquez was born in 1927. And a month later, uh, uh, the Revista de Occidente in Madrid published uh, an article translated by a German critic um, in which he coined the concept uh, magical realism. So the question is, how is it that this concept that actually was used to talk about mm, post um, abstract art in, in Europe has become not only a, a genre, but also applied to this novel. And one of the things that I discovered in the book is that when One Day of Solitude was published, nobody except for one critic, and, and I, I found uh, roughly a hundred reviews during the first year that 100 of Solitude was published. So I found them all in, I think so. And then out of these almost a hundred reviews that were published the first year the novel uh, was in the market, except for one critic, none of them said mm -hmm. that 100 of Solitude was a work of magical realism. And then the other one was this actually was not a famous critic, was just, you know, this Venezuelan um, critic that 
building on a reading of Urlar, 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 Urlar Pietri's works. Uh, yeah. Well, I think that the Garcia Marquez is like a magical realist like Uslar Pietri, but nothing else, right? right. So then was, what is really fascinating and what I do also in the second half of the book is really try to explain how the novel becomes a classic partly because it's associated with magical realism and comes to define what magical realism is. Even though Garcia Marquez was not writing 100 Solitude as a work of magical realism. On the contrary, the genre, the label, is applied to the novel and then becomes a thing of its own. So that now globally, the first work that comes to mind when we think about magical realism is, is one of solitude. And then this is a genre that now we can find in, you know, Hollywood movies, you know, The Shape of Water by Guillermo Toro or, you know, Encanto, like the last Disney movie, right? It's built on that notion of magical realism. But, but it's interesting to see that it was not the, the way the first reader of the first readers of the novel made sense of that novel. Yeah. And sort of how this magical realism then is so applied. And I think that uh, the way this term also becomes very popular is also uh, the, the players in this in this process as actually what you call them as the cultural brokers. Mm -hmm. So I think it would be nice to think about what you think these cultural brokers are. And actually one thing that you say there, and uh, as somebody doing literary studies, um, one of the things that you say, and is so poignant and to the point, and also a bit sad, uh, is that literary critics die with their generation, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they do a certain work, but whatever they say, do not last. But I also do think that they do play a role in- oh, absolutely. Creating perhaps a work, but their legacy is not that one, right? Yeah, but that's right. Then what other cultural brokers come into play mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. give this afterlife to a piece of work? Yeah, uh, I think that that's uh, as you said, maybe it's a sad, but important fact to acknowledge, which is that true. You know, we know that, say, War and Peace is a classic or the Ninth Symphony is a classic, but we don't remember what critics wrote about uh, War and Peace or uh, the Ninth Symphony when it came out, right? So criticism, while plays a role, you know, it's just uh, part of the story, right? And what I tried to do in, in the book, and let me now share another slide here. So I tried to uh, unpack this notion of, uh, where you go? okay. So cultural brokers. So what do I mean by that? Well, you know, in, in literary studies, in sociology, in history, uh, so we tend to value greatly the role of uh, critics, scholars, right, and academics at large. But if we really want to explain how something becomes classic, we also need to acknowledge that there are other actors and institutions or organizations and even objects involved in uh, the transformation of a work of art into a classic. And that's what I call uh, cultural brokers. Right? So these are individuals, as you can see from common readers, so even non-readers, right? So people who actually uh, have, haven't seen Hamlet, but yet they have heard about Hamlet, and then they would tell you, oh yeah, it's a classic, to be or not to be, right? So what that happened, that's actually an important cultural broker, believe it or not, and I show that in the book. Of course, teachers, peer reviews, priests, businessmen, war refugees, bloggers, artists, celebrities, influencers, politicians, these are actually people I identify in my study that have played a role in making the novel accessible to new generations. And of course, there are other uh, you know, organizations, right? So bookstores, awards, book clubs, mass media, social media platforms, right? And also other objects, right? Because, you know, Encanto, right? The, the new uh, Disney movie, right? It's an object that is basically containing within it a lot of uh, references to, um, to One Day of Solitude, right? There are video games that are also are inspired by uh, One Day of Solitude. We're going to see a Netflix series uh, probably sometime soon, right? And these are things, these are like cultural brokers, right? So, uh, and what is quite remarkable is precisely to, uh, to show that, that the status of a classic is not under the control of a single individual organization or object, right? So if tomorrow morning the Shakespeare um, Theater Company you know, disappears, that is not going to damage the status of uh, um, Hamlet or Shakespeare at large or as a classic, right? Even, even, you know, 
even maybe the UK would just sink and disappear and still people would actually continue to read Shakespeare in other locations, right? So what is really quite remarkable, and there I make the difference between the canonical book and the classic is that the canonical book depends on support from prestigious uh, uh, organizations and individuals to maintain its status. The classics, the classics uh, life is not really under the control of any cultural broker, but rather this vast constellation of um, brokers that are, you know, adding the little contribution to the, the life of the, the classic. Thank you. So in that note, let's invite uh, the floor here, our virtual floor, uh, and listen from the audience that I'm sure that has lots of questions and I'm sure that you already typed and you're ready to press enter. So if you wanna use the chat box, please, uh, use the chat box. Uh, if you would like to actually unmute yourself, please go ahead and start talking so we can hear you. Uh, and as you get ready, perhaps I'll give you a minute or two and I will ask one last question. I love that last bit in your novel that you actually pick five novels that are contemporary of 100 years of solitude and you sort of perhaps speculate, but also I think provide very good explanations why or how they did not have sort of uh, the life that 100 years of solitude had. Um, what made you think about that chapter? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is the, uh, as you're referring to it, so this is the last chapter of the book in which I, I try to do something more creative, which is you know, I don't want readers to think that I'm telling a success story. So even throughout the book, I'm actually telling readers, well, listen, so if Garcia Marquez had not met this person, maybe he wouldn't have written one of Solitude at all. Or if he had not read that book at, a, at that specific moment, he would not have, he would not have written one of Solitude the way he wrote it, right? So I'm really trying to, uh, discard this, uh, you know, a, a, a reading of, oh yeah, he just wrote the novel, was there in his mind when he was in his 20s and then he was just going through these ob obstacles, but he was going to succeed anyway. No, uh, you see many instances in which things could have gone the other way around, right? Okay, so then, uh, but at the same time, also the narrative is still, you know, to focus on one of solitude. Then what I, I do in the, in the last chapter, is to basically ask, well, what if, you know, Christopher Marlowe instead of uh, Shakespeare who ha would have lived the life that Shakespeare lived and then Shakespeare would have actually died in his thirties as Christopher Marlowe do, right? What if some of the, the works of ancient Greek literature would have survived with the Odyssey and the Iliad would be the, uh, the, the primary classics of uh, today, right? So what if One Year of Solitude had, had been published, you know, 10 years before or 10 years after would have become a global classic, right? So then what I, I, I set up the scene by asking these questions and then I chose uh, five works of fiction. I actually had a list of 50 at the beginning, mm -hmm. but, <clears throat> but, you know, that was, uh, that was way too long. Uh, and then I narrow it down to, you know, like 25 and then to 10 and then to five. So, and I'm basically selecting books that, came out before uh, Garcia Marquez um, wrote One Day of Solitude and then books that were published more or less at the same time. And what I basically tried to show is that some of these books and authors ha had either a similar professional trajectory, they had like a similar uh, um, kind of imagination, literary imagination, and they even were writing books that were thematically, they were quite similar and yet they didn't become classics, right? So, uh, you know, so, and then I started thinking about why didn't become classics, right? And then what I tried to show is that, you know, becoming a classic, right? It's this very complex process in which you cannot simply say, oh yeah, he was a genius or, you know, he had bad cells on his side or uh, because of the boom or because of the rise of the middle classicals because the text was written in this beautiful prose, no. So you actually need to bring together the different factors and then see how they, uh, they came together and then they produced this tapestry upon which the One Year of Solitude became more successful than say, El Obsceno Pájaro de la Noche, de José Donoso, mm -hmm. or El Zorro de Arriba, El Zorro de Abajo uh, by uh, José María Arguedas, right? Mm -hmm. Which you know, are incredible 
literally yeah. works, but didn't make it into yeah. you know, that kind of classic universe. Yeah, and I was actually struck by your choice of Paradiso, of mm -hmm. Leta Marima, and it was really amazing. I think Pedro Jesus wants to make a question. Please yes. go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, you have mentioned the places where uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez uh, stay some time with, while writing the book. And uh, I think Barcelona is a very, was very special. But uh, what role, which role played not only Barcelona, but also the atmosphere of Barcelona and especially Carmen Barcel, because she was the agent, not only for Garcia Marquez, but for many people of this uh, Latin American uh, boom and also the, the what was named afterwards the, the, the magical uh, realism. Uh, I think she was a key figure, not only at the time, but afterwards, but uh, for Garcia Marquez and many others, she was like uh, uh, the motor that made the whole thing possible to, to, mm -hmm. to, 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 to have this uh, uh, great success. And also yeah, you mentioned absolutely. the marketing, I think it was very, very good at that. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a, that's an excellent question. I'm actually happy that my colleague Ana Casas Aguilar is also part of this uh, presentation because she's an expert on Carmen Balcel. So um, I invite you to also check her, her work on um, Balcells. Uh, you know, in what concerns um, Garcia Marquez and Balcells, you know, as I was saying before, had not Garcia Marquez met uh, Carmen Balcells, maybe he would not have written 100 of Solitude because because Carmen Balcells arrived to Mexico City in 1965 when Garcia Marquez was actually investing like 85% of his time in the film industry in Mexico. And then he came to him and, and said to him, hey, listen, I want to be your uh, literary agent full time and I want you to become a professional writer. And then weeks after that, Garcia Marquez sat down and then started writing a novel that he had in his mind for almost 20 years, One Honey of Solitude, right? And he struggled to write that novel several times, but it was not after, until, you know, he signed the contract with Valcells that he realized that, oh yeah, this is my opportunity. I really need to sit down and then write this novel, right? And also Pedro, uh, you know, I just wanna let you know that I, so Oxford University has just released an, an Oxford handbook on Garcia Marquez and my contribution to that handbook is actually a chapter about the reception of Garcia Marquez in Spain. Um, one of the things I discovered is actually Garcia Marquez was exposed to Spanish culture very early on. So he read Garcia Lorca, uh, Gomez de la Serna, uh, uh, Machado in his, in his teens, right? So Garcia Marquez was actually someone who up until his eighties was able to recite uh, by heart uh, poems from the, the golden age, the Edad de Oro, uh, the, 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 the Siglo de Oro in uh, España. And of course, also when he encountered uh, Don Quixote, who was absolutely marveled by it. And in a way, also one of the books that really influenced the style and the narrative in 100 of Solitude, as I show in my book, is Don Quixote, right? So then, uh, so the, the influence of Spain on Garcia Marquez actually happened even way before he met uh, Carmen Balcells, and then when he traveled to a uh, move to um, Barcelona, uh, yeah, Balcells really helped him to become uh, uh, an international superstar. Absolutely, yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any more questions? I'm looking at the chat box, and actually, you have somebody joining from Italy who loves your book and actually is teaching it uh, for mm -hmm. uh, for her classes. So that's good, and I'm sure that is very rewarding uh, for you to hear. Uh, the afterlife that your book is having. And also we have somebody joining from Barcelona. Do we have any other questions? Um, I have many more. So I'm gonna ask a couple more just with the hope that uh, other people will join in or if they wanna unmute themselves. Um, so after that, you make that uh, comparison between 100 Years of Solitude and these other contemporary novels. You have an appendix, which I think is really useful for us, both as readers, as teachers, as literary critics, and so on. And I'm going to hold my question because Ana Casas has a question. Ana, please go ahead. Hello, Ana. Hi, thank you, Alvaro, and thank you, Rosie. 
It's very nice to hear you and see you. Uh, my question for Alvaro is about, like you have spoken about the personal influences or the like the day by day um, relationships that impact Gar Garcia Marquez. And I wanted to ask you like a little bit as a sociologist, how do you see those in relation mm. to literary influences of other texts that have had impact him? Like, um, like, would you put them at the same level or would you put them at different level? Like, do you read them differently because some of them come from other books and are literary references and others come from people he might have admired or with mm -hmm. whom he shared his work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel that, thank you, Ana, for your question. I think that Garcia Marquez was really... Um, humble in his approach to uh, who could actually influence his work so he was in that sense a sponge so he would just absorb um any any text any reference that that could help him to improve his uh, his writing so in that sense what it's really impressive is actually how how to see that you know the the you know a character or a, a theme or an idea would actually come from you know, not necessarily uh, the work of a major uh, writer, but could actually have come from you know a work by you know a relatively unknown Colombian writer or you know an obscure work by a major author. So in that sense, he was really interested in how you know I can learn things that would he can incorporate ideas that would move the story forward. So um, so yeah. Great, thank you, Anna, for that question. Uh, we also have a comment on the chat box that says that they could have enjoyed two hours on the book, but unfortunately, we only have uh, an hour. Um, so the question that I wanted to briefly ask, or at least call your attention, uh, call the attention of our audience to your book, is that you actually have an appendix where you sort of uh, give us a map to think about how to study a classic. And mm -hmm. what are some of the elements that we should take into account in thinking, not only about the book or the work itself, but what surrounds it. And in a way, I find that gesture uh, very uplifting because we think about these works of art not only as an individual production, but more sort of a collective engagement that we need to keep on collaborating to keep them uh, relevant in our lives. Um, so what are some of your advice very quickly for our audience before we say goodbye? Yeah, thank you, Rossi. Well, I think that you know, a classic is not going to be a classic forever, right? So as you're putting it, it's, it's a contract that we sign collectively every generation to sustain the status of that classic. And, and that's the reason why we also need to think about socialization, right? So this teacher, for instance, well, you're not only teaching the text um, in the, to your Italian uh, students, you're actually, you know, also kind of uh, reproducing that contract that the next generation of uh, readers are going to sign with that book to uh, turn it into a classic, right? So, and as you're saying, yeah, so in the, in the appendix, I really tried to show uh, strategies that we can use to precisely um, study how these otherwise, you know, uh, abstract and uh, mythological or mythical object can actually be turned into, into, into something that we can study uh, with primary sources and, you know, with grounded, um, uh, uh, you know, framework uh, and, 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 you know, and very concrete way of uh, um, studying it. Yeah. Yeah. We have one last question here. It says, thank you for this fascinating talk. Where would Alvaro, you, place 100 years in the literary output of Garcia Marquez? Does the focus mm -hmm. on one work distract from his other great works? Yeah. Well, I think that uh, Garcia Marquez himself would say um, that One Year of Solitude was the book that was, you know, up there. Uh, you know, it's a book that can no longer be, you know, after so many years, you know, easily removed from that the that category. Uh, and I think that many many readers around the world continue to see that one of his major and uh, major literary work. But it is also true that many people enjoy um, many of the other works. And I think also something that makes Garcia Marquez, such a popular writer, is that he didn't just write a single popular book, but he wrote actually many, and that's rare. You know, not many uh, professional writers get to publish so many books that are actually so beloved. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Alvaro, for this 
Fantastic conversation. Um, I think that you might have plans to come uh, to this area at some point next year. Yeah. I think that we should host you again to have the second part of this conversation, <laughs> which is the fallout of the boom and how friends become frenemies. Oh, uh, yeah. That yeah. should be really a, a fun conversation to have. Uh, so hopefully our cultural broker, the Instituto Cervantes, uh, could yeah, that's right. host us. Uh, yes, for and also I heard that uh, uh, you are uh, uh, preparing the book in Spanish. So yeah, that's right. It is ready when you are around. That would be great to have you. Yeah, thank you. That would be wonderful indeed. Thank you, Alvaro, again thank for you, your Rossi. time, for your work. Thank you, Pedro. And thank you, uh, Instituto and Durham. To this uh, book, I recommend everyone who teaches this book to enjoy this book, uh, to read Gashrias Marquez's 100 Years of Solitude. This is an amazing book that complements that story and teaches us a lot about how literature is part of our daily lives. Thank you so much, Alvaro. Thank you, Pedro Jesus. And hope to see you, you. all uh, next year. Happy holidays and have a good winter break. Yeah, thank you. Happy holidays. Thank you to you both. It was great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we keep thank you. Back. Yeah.